Okay, class, welcome to another class period. Welcome to another episode. Um, and this time you could see I am joined by four other people. This is the first time that we are having a panel discussion. The reason we're having a panel discussion today is um, the five of us have spoken before and been pretty active in following the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the MCU, um, especially the Disney Plus shows that have been released since January 2021. And so I wanted to bring people back to talk with the class. Um, and so we have Jamie Williams with us. And um, Jamie is now a new faculty member at Tennessee Tech University. So she'll be starting in the fall. So that's a, that's a really cool thing. Um, Lisa Donato Glasner is here from the Castle Run and Core Memory Candles. Um, Ryan Beckman is here from my Disney classroom. And then Sarah Bills Sager is here um, from Slightly Problematic. And so you have um, heard from all of these people before or will hear from all of these people during the semester at some point. Um, but I wanted to bring everybody here to talk about the MCU and kind of go over some topics. Before we do that, um, I want to give everybody, if you could uh, give us a minute or two, kind of that brief introduction and sort of reacquaint the, the students with, with your story. So um, we'll start on my screen. I see Jamie first, so we'll kind of start there and then and go around the circle. Hi, I'm Jamie Williams, and like Cody said, I am starting as an assistant professor in management um, at Tennessee Tech this this fall. Today is actually the day we're recording. This is my first day as an official faculty member. So pretty excited about that. But I've been teaching at Ole Miss um, the last five years and working on my PhD. Um, I kind of, I was born in Central Florida, so I was kind of born a Disney fan. But then we moved away when I was about 13 and my family didn't really like we never really went back. So I rediscovered my fandom um, about six or seven years ago and um, through WDW radio and going to their events and it being in that community, I really engaged with other Disney fans and it just increased my fandom even more. Um, I love the MCU. I remember seeing Iron Man, uh, the original Iron Man in the, the movie theater. And I'm pretty sure I've seen every single movie except the Incredible Hulk um, in the theaters since then. So I'm pretty excited about MCU. I don't know anything about the comics. so I don't really have a background there, but um, since this show started, I've kind of dug more into them. So, um, but yeah, that's me. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Lisa, you're next on the screen. Hey guys, um, so I think you've already met me um, from what Cody has said, but uh, my name is Lisa Denoto Glasner. Um, my blog is thecastlerun.com and I'm very active on Instagram as the Castle Runner. I also have a candle shop called Core Memory Candles that subtly bring the sense of Disney into your home um, in a beautiful way. And they're actually behind me. Um, so uh, yeah, my Disney fandom, um, and, and this goes together with what my blog is all about, um, my Disney fandom sort of reignited um, in my adulthood after I had my children. We came to Disney um, on a sort of get out of Dodge trip because we've been dealing with a lot of stuff and this place just kind of clicked with me in all the ways. Um, and fast forward to now, we actually live 1.2 miles as the crow flies from Cinderella Castle um, and get to listen to the water pageant and see the fireworks in our backyard at night. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so obviously we're fully immersed. Um, we live very normal lives, but we're fully immersed in, um, in our Disney fandom. And as far as the MCU is concerned, I too did not grow up with comics. My dad was a big comics um, reader growing up. So I think I just had like a vague appreciation of them, but certainly wasn't into them myself um, and got into the MCU pretty much from the get go. And it has sort of increased over time as I've seen like sort of the complexity of things and the things that I can dig into and just how smartly these things are being done. Um, you know, my, my MCU fandom um, has, has grown leaps and bounds. And then because of that, especially recently with some of, um, which we'll talk about, of course, some of the um, Disney Plus shows, um, I have now kind of backtracked and started reading the comics um, and enjoying those a lot as well. So that's my backstory and I'm sticking right. to it. Thank you, Lisa. And then Ryan. Hey, yeah. So yeah, my name's Ryan Beckman. I'm here in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, I am an educator. I teach at a middle school here locally, uh, science. 
And uh, before uh, I was an educator, I uh, did brain research at Washington University Medical. Uh, that was kind of my, my career path and I jumped to education. And when I jumped to education, I kind of um, had this passion for inspiring um, my students really with uh, being you know, problem solvers and creative thinkers and, and kind of um, what I've morphed into uh, just masterful storytellers uh, in, in, their, in their pursuit of education and then beyond and whatever their, their passions are. And that led me to kind of fall back on um, a, a project that I think we all probably can remember from our early edu uh, education days in elementary school where um, you know, the teacher asks us to pick a famous person, read their biography, and, and then write a report, right? And so I don't know why I picked Walt Disney, but I did. Um, and uh, that's probably where the seeds got planted for me, like this, this idea of being an innovator and creativity and, um, you know, and the passion for, for my fandom and, and Walt Disney really stems from that and what that has been throughout the company through the Imagineers and, and so forth and what they're doing today. So that led me to, to uh, join um, kind of up with some like-minded educators and we've done some things around uh, professional development and um, we've two, uh, my partner, Dr. Howard de Blasi, and me have formed a podcast. We're on starting year seven currently of that podcast called the My Disney Class Podcast. And we also take uh, educators on field trips to the Walt Disney World to, to kind of show them how, you know, Walt Disney is, in my opinion, the best at telling stories and innovating and being creative. And so what a better place, what a what better playground, I guess I would challenge anybody to to let me know if there is one to go learn about those things and how they can apply to the education field. Um, so that's kind of my where my passion in, in, in Disney lies. Um, MCU, I'm like the other panel guests here that have already introduced themselves. I'm kind of similar. I, I read the comics back, but I wasn't like a big comic book fan. I had them. I probably have ones that were probably worth money or that I'd love to have right now that my mom is dad have tossed out or sold in a garage sale at some point, but I had them, and I, but I was not a Marvel, you know, uh, purist. I also was reading DC comics, like Batman or, was probably a big one of mine uh, back in the day, I remember, but that was all many, many years ago in my young days, and now I, I have a giant gap where I didn't, you know, I can't even tell you what those stories were, and I think I read them in kind of, you know, sporadic time, so I don't know if I even knew the themes back then when I was a kid. But now that when Disney purchased uh, Marvel a, a few years back, I, I jumped back into the kind of MCU world. So the movies are kind of where anything that um, I, my knowledge is lies on. And then I go back that I'm really big in the details. Uh, and I love the little nuances and the connections between all the stories in, in Marvel. I'm sure we'll talk about going on. And so I'll go back and try to piece together what did that mean? <laughs> and so I uh, spent a lot of time on on YouTube and stuff, listening to the ones that the kids that did read that stuff passionately back then and now are young adults and sharing their knowledge with uh, uh, us novice that are trying to figure it all out. So that's where I'm at. All right, thank you, Ryan. And then Sarah. Hello, I am Sarah. I graduated last year with a master's in anthropology and a master's in library science. Um, I focused on film-based tourism which is how I got involved in this. <laughs> you see something on TV or a movie and you wanna go see it for yourself, basically. Um, I focused also a lot in museums and archives and that's where I wanna be headed. Um, I got into Disney pretty young, kid of the 90s, glorious time to grow up. Um, I really loved going to the parks with my family. I have worked in the parks a couple of times, and I also really love cosplay. Like, that is how I really enjoy a lot of my fandoms. I'm doing a casual, low-key cosplay today, so um, nice. so everyone's clear. That's where I stand on that. <laughs> um, I didn't really grow up with Marvel. I was really a DC kid growing up. Um, I watched a lot of Linda Carter, Wonder Woman, and a lot of... Um, I think it was a Super Friends, which is not how DC tells their stories right now. Very different uh, theming, color scheme. Um, but yeah, Iron Man came out and I was like, this is awesome. 
And then when Avengers came out, I was like, this is unreal. I don't understand what's happening and I love it. So um, I actually think my first like casual cosplay was Captain America. So love him, lots of fun. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about all the things that I love. <laughs> all right, perfect. And again, thank you everyone for agreeing to do this. Um, this has been something we, we, we've talked about for a while. Um, and I, I'm really, really excited to, to get into these themes. And I originally sent everybody four topics that we were going to talk about. This last week, another topic presented itself. And I want to spend a lot of time on it, but I do want to touch on it. The, the news that um, Scarlett Johansson and her, I guess, legal team are have filed suit against Disney for the release strategy of Black Widow being day and date. It was released in theaters the same day it was um, released on Disney Plus as Premier Access. And so a little bit of my initial reaction, and I want to get people's kind of initial reactions and, and what they think kind of this means for the future of entertainment, because we are literally in this new environment of how movies will be released. I don't think it's just going to be this year that day and date happens. I believe we are seeing that with things like premiere access and day and date, I, I really think things like that will continue into the future. And so how does that kind of change these relationships that the talent has with the, the creatives and also with the distribution company. Um, my initial reactions or reaction, and this, is, this was somewhat formulated by reading some statements, uh, one by Greg Heilman, who the students will know have spoken in the class before, um, that I just kind of felt like eventually something like this was going to happen to kind of work out these details. Um, and that, that here on moving forward, what happened with the pandemic was such a game changer for so many studio, for virtually every studio, um, that making the decision to put things on streaming services and foregoing that exclusivity with theater chains is something that needs to be worked out and needs to Kind of, we need to be, I guess there needs to be more transparency as to what revenue sharing is going to be between the talent and between the, the studios. Um, and that's where I kind of, as I said before we started recording, um, that's where sort of my knowledge on it stops. That's just kind of my take on it. Um, for this one, uh, we'll go ahead, Lisa, I, I'll give you the floor first for, for kind of your reactions so far to this? Um, yeah, so yeah, I do have a legal background just as a quick pro quo, but not in entertainment law or anything. So I'm not like specifically <clears throat> qualified for this, but um, just, you know, just in, in my personal opinion, you know, like we were talking about before, you know, this, so contracts exist for when circumstances change. That's why you write contracts. So when you sit down at the table and everybody signs, everybody agrees and they sign. And then the reason you have the contract is so that if opinions change or circumstances change down the road, you have a prior agreement that everybody can rely on. So that's what a contract is just in its essence, right? Um, and so contracts are written with the expectation of change, but like change like this doesn't happen very often. So obviously the situation when they first signed versus when they were choosing how to go about releasing, um, releasing the movie you know, the formula and the world situation had changed um, quite a lot. Um, and like I also mentioned before we started recording, you know, Disney had two choices. You know, the four corners of the agreement are what they are and they're, they're not in the wrong, um, you know, and whether or not they cared about their ongoing relationship with ScarJo um, probably had a lot with, to do with the decision that they made. Um, Black Widow was the last movie. If they had just signed a seven, you know, seven movie contract with her, things would probably be a little bit different. 
Um, so yeah, we'll see how this plays out. I mean, you know, beyond that, it, you know, lesson learned. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of entertainment lawyers updating their contract forms and, um, you know, you kind of figure out how the money shakes out and kind of what the proper flow is now that these different mediums are being used. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. You know, it, it's just a matter of, you know, did the, did the circumstances change enough to justify having to revisit the contract? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and like I said, you know, if Disney cared more about their ongoing relationship with her, maybe they would have made a different decision. Well, and real quick before, before I forget, um, Lisa is with something like this, I would imagine that there was, there were a lot of conversations and I would actually imagine that there were amendments to contracts before these decisions were made. Um, but it kind of before like a movie like Black Widow was released day and date on premiere access. Um, it sort of seems like, at least in the public, that 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 didn't happen. Um, am I wrong to think that kind of the, the normal way to go about this would have been you have those engaged conversations beforehand and like there are amendments to the contract or is that something that that doesn't typically happen. And again, I know your, your background, I'm not holding you to your background for this. Yeah, yeah. and I, I don't have like, you know, firsthand knowledge of what, what's in the, you know, the, the agreement, but, um, but yeah, so any decent agreement is going to be written to, to, with a clause that says that this is the entire agreement. It's called an entirety clause, entirety provision. And it's basically that line that it's like boilerplate at the end of every contract that you read that basically says that whatever we talked about before doesn't matter. It's just what's on the page. And the purpose of that is to say, like, you can't go back to things we said before. Like, what we agreed is written here. Um, and that goes forward, too. So... Um, you know, the contract is the contract and it's what binds everyone moving forward. And, um, you know, you can have just like beforehand, you can have discussions afterwards, but unless there's an actual amendment to the contract that binds everyone, um, then it's, it's not effective. So, um, you know, unless they formally amended the contract under the terms of how it has to be amended under the contract, it is what it is. And it doesn't matter what conversations were had before or after. Um, you know, and that's might have been some sloppy lawyering that came into it. I again can't speak to the situation, but um, you know, maybe good faith was trusted a little bit more than it should have been. Okay. And then Sarah, um, you were the the one who originally reached out, um, kind of saying, "Hey, this is something that's happening right now. Is this something that we're going to touch on or not?" Um, and you said you had some thoughts on it as well. I have very mixed feelings about this whole thing especially being a spectator like this is pure speculation on everything i think my main wish is that it wasn't scarlett johansson who was doing this she just has this history of being tone deaf <laughs> so it really when i first heard about it it came across as hey that 20 million dollars was not enough disney and I was like, oh my God, girl, do you know how many people like would a $1 million in the last year would have changed people's lives? <laughs> like it's been a rough year. So that was my initial response. I was like, oh man, she's doing it again. But yeah, no, Disney absolutely should have contacted her and explained it to her. And I mean, it's been delayed over a year. And that's like not counting production delays because this movie has been trying to be made for ever, right? It's been, it's been a while. Um, uh, I, just, I just wish it had been someone else besides her is okay. where I'm at. <laughs> okay. And, you know, it, it was uh, this last month, there was um, at least kind of released in some of the trades and, and, and made its way around the internet that um, she is going to, not with Marvel, but she's supposed to have a relationship on a um, new Tower of Terror remake, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think at, at the least she's going to be executive producer. So it definitely would be interesting to see if this, how it impacts relationships. I tend to think water under the bridge where money can be made or when money can be made, but you know we, we don't know that. 
either. Um, Jamie, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, she was also executive producer for Black Widow. So in theory, she should be getting an additional cut of everything anyway. Yeah. So I'll never have $20 million. That's okay. It's fine. I will quickly chime in though. The one thing I didn't mention was Disney's response. And I thought it was awful, like yeah. so tasteless. You know, she was do what she was do under the contract. Disney's yeah. making their money. I bet you they're making, well, I mean, clearly they're making more than tw the 20 million that, that ScarJo is making. So, you know, to come out, you know, in response to a reasonable contract claim and say, you know, oh, I guess 20 million wasn't enough for her. And she's blind to like the situation with COVID that the world's been through for yeah. the last few years. That, that's, that's an awful, awful character slamming response to a perfectly reasonable contract claim. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Disney, you know, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100. But um, yeah, the, the response, and, and you can see it in Sarah's you know, the response to like, you know, 21, 20 million wasn't enough for you. Well, that's exactly what Disney wanted you to say when yeah. they responded the way that they did. Like, and, and I think, you know, th that, that response, I, I don't know, that will be interesting to see if that does impact a relationship moving forward. It definitely was awkward, puts, it was harsh. A, a very, puts this situation in a very, like awkward light, like they could have come out and sort of, you never, you never want to admit that, yes, this is something that we need to work out, but sort of talk about, you know, this, this is a new model and we are dealing with a situation that we've never had to deal with before. And so these things need to be worked out and, and not say we welcome lawsuits, but we welcome, you know, discussion and things like that. I think that kind of response we regret Probably. to learn about ScarJo's, you know, re response to our, you know, decisions. We've tried to make good decisions in light of the change in the world situations, and we look forward to privately discussing this with her. End of story. Yep. Like, you know, just that's it. I'll write, yep. I'll write your copy for you. Like, just it, oh. it, it could have been dealt with so much more tastefully, yeah. you know, in a way that didn't slam either side. Yeah. Uh, Jamie, uh, did you? Oh, oh Ryan, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, I, I don't know. I, I literally, this is so uh, fun hearing um, a little bit about it because, I mean, just yesterday, my wife told me I was been, I've been kind of buried a little bit. She's like, hey, did you see that Scarlett Johansson is suing Disney? And I was like, no. So I, I know nothing about it, to be honest with you, besides what I just heard here. But I just think that, I mean, this industry has been, is constantly evolving and changing. So I feel like it's not, it's not as new as we think. Because I mean, just look, when I was a kid, you, you had to go to the movies to see a movie. And then if you didn't, if you missed its run, you had to wait a good year before it ever came out on like a VHS tape. Kids uh, listening to this, that's, look it up, Google it. It's, it's a thing we used to watch movies on and we couldn't stream them. Um, so, and then that time table changed over it evolved i mean and surely that's i don't know anything about contracts and surely don't know nothing about lowering at all but those contracts had to change in there too like okay this will be released on vhs tape in six months it'll come out on then we had like hbo and showtime and these kind of uh movie channels and they started buying into that you know they were buying these these movies however that works and um you know those were they were coming out you know i would say before the streaming services hit and stuff. I mean, movies, I want to say like what, in like two months after they came out, two, three months, they were out on, you know, Showtime or HBO or something, you could watch them. So that's, I'm sure that factors all into it, but um, you know, it just, it's an evolving thing. And I'm, I'd be surprised at, like if there wasn't something in the contract that, that had that spelled out somewhere and with Disney knowing about its streaming services, because it's not, I don't, I mean, my opinion, again, it's not going away because Disney and whatever you got, Paramount Plus, you've got um, Netflix, all these streaming services, right? Um, but places like Disney that put it, are actually producing the movies and putting them out, this is just a way to, to squeeze the middleman, the movie theaters of distribution, right? They don't, they don't have to pay them as much to carry their movie because they don't need them anymore. Um, you know, they, they've got, they can put it right out to the people. Now, there is something to be said about going and watching a movie in a, a huge screen and surround sound and you know, whatever. Now they got chairs that recline and heated and whatever else they can do for you. Um, but, uh, 
you know, there's something to be said for that, but that is not as important anymore, I think, to Disney or fill in the blank with whatever, you know, Fox or, or well, that's, that's, well, whatever, pick it, Warner Brothers um, production company because they don't, they don't need them as much. So I think all this is really in the big picture is bigger than Sarah or Sarah, um, Johansson, Scarlett Johansson and, uh, and Disney because it's just going to be, I mean, the movie theaters are the ones that are probably like, go, go Scarlett, go. Like we need some, somebody to fight for us a little bit or we're not, we're not going to make it out of this. So that, that's, that's my take on it. But I, I don't mind Scarlett doing it because whether it's 20 million or whatever, um, I always think of like baseball players when people get upset about baseball players and their contracts and moving and stuff. Well, he's not happy with, you know, whatever, 15 million over, you know, the next three years, whatever, and they leaves and go somewhere else. Well, the owners may make billions on his back or whoever the players back. So I see the same thing for, for her. So the, yeah, though, I would, you know, if you, if Disney told me they're going to give me 20 million to do anything, you know, I pretty much be there because 20 million to me is, is a, is a big deal. And, and to Scarlett, maybe not so much, you know, asking for a little bit more. So I don't know, that's where my mind falls on that. Well, and that's a conversation we have a lot in, in my, uh, my sport management classes is students will bring that up about the, the number of the size of a contract. And, and we just kind of always have to go with, look, it's, it's relative. It's not, yes, to us, it, it's completely out of this world, but a lot of these people aren't living in the same kind of, at least financial world that we are. So, so it, it's, it's relative. And when you break it down to like, if, if you're impacted this way, um, it, it makes a little bit, I guess, puts it in a little bit different situation, maybe. Jamie, did you have reactions to it before we yeah, so I was pretty disappointed with Disney's response, and I actually had the opposite reaction to Sarah. I was like, well, she's owed what she's owed. I mean, Disney is a multi-billion dollar company. They, I mean, we don't know how much money they actually made off of Black Widow for the Disney Plus release. So she is entitled to that money, honestly. But I think the bigger issue is going to be the signal that Disney is sending to their people and people who may work with them in the future or who may want who Disney may want to work for them. Because, I mean, that's a pretty crappy way to treat an employee. She's, she's still their employee. So when you take an HR perspective of it, that's a really bad way to handle this kind of situation. It should have been done privately and it shouldn't, she shouldn't have been slammed in the press for advocating for what she wants. And I think it looks even worse for Disney because this was supposed to be the first big female led superhero movie. So I think it makes Disney look even worse because of that historical aspect. Um, this was supposed to be good, good for women, good for, um, good for that female image that yes, a women, a female led superhero movie can make money and can do well. And you should make more of them because these people, these are interesting characters. They're not just plot devices um, to, you know, to move things forward. So I honestly think it made Disney look pretty bad for, from both of those perspectives, from just treating an employee that way, but also the historical aspects of the female led superhero movie. Okay. And, and real quick, does anybody have any more comments about that? Um, Cause I, I think it, it's an evolving situation. Definitely. We'll see how it plays out. Um, Lisa mentioned lesson learned. Um, I, I don't think you respond that way. Um, when you are the deep pocket, um, it, it, it does come off looking a little awkward at best, I think. Um, so then the, the, the four themes or the four kind of items that we were going to talk about um, was for starting with your reactions to the shows. And really what we're talking about right now is the three Disney Plus shows. They're the first Disney Plus show. I'm sorry, they're the first Marvel shows on Disney Plus. Um, obviously starting with WandaVision and then the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Um, Loki just finished. And then because Black Widow um, was released at the same time or about the same time, uh, we were going to cover that one as well. Um, and so I want to combine the first two items because one, the first one was 
just kind of your general reactions to the shows and the movie so far like this is the beginning of phase four this is also the first time and you know if, if you went to see black widow in the theater is the first time you probably saw a mcu movie in a theater in two years um there was such a long gap between spider-man um far from home and wandavision that people were just i think just searching for content wherever they could um, but then I also want to combine that with asking you how these shows have impacted your fandom, because that's something we all have talked about. And each of you kind of briefly talked about it in your introductions, um, but how these three shows and one uh, theatrical movie now has impacted your MCU fandom. So let's go ahead and start. Jamie, we'll start with you. Um, I love the MCU shows. WandaVision was just, it was something so new and so different. Um, and that really got me into starting to look at um, all these things, like, because they hid so many Easter eggs and nobody knew what was going on. And there were all these serious lines everywhere. I mean, some of my friends and I got together weekly to discuss what just happened? What do you think's going on? And I think that really sparked a major conversation. It's one of those like water cooler, though, through Zoom at this point, um, type conversations where everybody is talking about it and everybody is wondering what's going on. And I think that was really smart for Disney to put that out there to kind of engage people back to the content. And it made me start, like Ryan talked about earlier, I went on YouTube and every after I watched every show, I watched the YouTube videos that were being done by the people who were big comic book fans so they could help me understand what was ha happening. Um, I was kind of disappointed that there weren't more payoffs in the end. I love the show front to back, like beginning to end. And I'm all for that story. And the theme of grief was kind of timely because we were kind of grieving our way of life kind of disappearing almost, you know, at that point, it, it, we were, it's what, at that point, we were nine months, 10 months into a, a pandemic kind of shutdown where, so I love the theme that they were talking about. I loved the show. I love that it spurred conversations and really got people into the MCU. Um, and I think the other two shows also did something very different, like the more traditional Marvel show of Captain, uh, uh, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, um, that was just great for the traditional Marvel fans, but it still had that mysterious aspect of who's the power broker. And I love that it was Sharon Carter. Um, I know that wasn't a, I, I know some people have feelings about that. I like it personally, but, and then you have Loki, which was very interesting. I mean, Loki's this great character, very driven, looking into his psyche a little bit. Why do you do what you do? And then how you're, how are you moving that story forward? for which is going to be a major driver i think in phase four is going to be the the backstory of loki and the, the time the tva and um kang the conqueror so I, I i think they all bring something different i and i just i really enjoyed all the shows and they've really driven my fandom to another level like i'm just i'm like hungry for news like what's happening what's going next what's going on and I did go see Black Widow in the theaters because I was just like I'm not not going to see this movie in the theaters uh, Lisa <laughs> um well it was a tough act to follow you got it all out <laughs> <laughs> it was really good I'm like oh god I'm like taking notes while you're talking <laughs> um no so you know one division like it had me from hello and like it probably was all the more because we hadn't had content for such a long time but i just loved the show and i know some people like didn't love the first two episodes and really started to get into it once it picked up like i was into it from the moment it started and again maybe that had something to do with the fact that like i grew up with my mom like watching i love lucy and stuff and so i like was kind of comforted by those first couple of shows um but yeah, I loved it from the, from the moment it started. And I think like the reason that it grabbed so many of us was, I mean, first of all, it's just a phenomenal show, but it also had, like, it was a puzzle. Like it felt like this, like, you know, nine episode long escape room. Um, and it's, and we weren't crazy because they were, they do hide mm -hmm. stuff there. They, every detail is on purpose. Like there is no, there, nothing on that set is not there on purpose. So 
it's not like you're on this like you know mouse hunt for or you know, this hunt for like something that that we're making up like it, it all was real um and so i found myself you know just like jamie like the episode would end like i and and i looked forward to it every week like every i watched it on friday mornings like i'd wake up early in the morning and watch it i don't remember the last show i did that for um and then i would go and i would like watch all the youtube videos afterwards and talk to people about it and like talk about it on instagram and um and I think that I started like branching out with the, like, cause I'll watch YouTube videos while I work. So I would watch stuff about WandaVision and then kind of branch out. And one day I had this brilliant guy on who knows so much about comics. And he was basically, he did this full video that was the entire like uni universe history of Marvel, like from like chronologically. And I had it playing in the background. And all of a sudden I realized that I had been hearing someone talk about World War II for like mm -hmm. 20 minutes. And I was like, did, my, did the video end? And I just haven't been paying attention and they're talking about history now. So I looked and, you know, obviously like it, it was the Marvel, like they had been talking for 20 minutes about historical facts about World War II in the, and, and, and it was a Marvel video. And I was like, there's this whole universe here that I didn't know existed. And I kind of felt the same way I felt when like I got into Harry Potter and I was like, oh my gosh, there's this universe that I can escape into that's like this fully developed, beautiful thing. And I kind of felt that way as I was like sort of getting into the comics because I was enjoying WandaVision so much. Um, and so this whole world has kind of opened up to me that I'm really enjoying in the comics um, while I'm watching the MCU alongside it. Um, so yeah, so WandaVision had me from hello and I just, I loved every minute of it. I really, I just really just, enjoyed it more than I've enjoyed anything in a really long time. Falcon and the Winter Soldier was a, you know, it, it, it was, it had a tough job <laughs> to, to follow that. Um, it's a very different show, obviously. Um, it didn't grab me in the same way. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it for what it was, I guess. I, I think I enjoyed some of the like character exposition more than other people did mm -hmm. versus other things. Um, and it was, it was an interesting story about friendship and, identity. I personally felt it was a little heavy handed at the end. Um, I think they were preaching on some topics that maybe they hadn't earned the right to talk about the way that they did just based on character development, but that's just my opinion. Um, and as far as Loki is concerned, it, you know, Tom Hiddleston can do no wrong. He's, it, he was so good. I loved Owen Wilson, which was delightful mm -hmm. to me because I didn't know how I was, how much I was going to like him and Amar, like I couldn't see it. Um, but I loved it. And I loved the two of them on screen together. Um, it was just really smartly done. I think I probably would have been more like, you know, grabbing the table when I was watching it if I didn't know the title of the Doctor Strange movie going in. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, like, like, do they have to? Couldn't they have just given us yeah. a filler title like for a little while? And like, I'm sure it would have leaked, but still, like, you know, so it was kind of a bummer, like, kind of knowing what was going to happen at the end from the start because we knew what was happening with Dr. Strange, but um, it was great. I mean, He Who Remains was brilliantly executed. Like I loved everything about it. And, um, you know, I know I'm in the minority, but I didn't love the, um, I didn't love the end credit scene. I don't love for, her as Val at all. I think Oh, the end credit scene for, for Black Widow? The end credit scene. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, for, yeah, I'm jumping ahead. So yeah, so that's all I've got on Loki. And then yeah, Black Widow, I, I mean, it was a good spy movie. I don't know, like I watched the movie and I sat on it for like a week trying to think like what I was gonna say about it. And then I watched the last episode of Loki and I was like, you know, I need to stop thinking so much about Black Widow. Like it was just a fun movie. It was good. Like I have a lot to say about whether or not they made use of the characters. And I have a lot to say about, about Black Widow that's not fantastic, but it was a good spy movie at the end of the day. Um, and, um, you know, I would have loved to have seen a little more character development in, you know, the rare, the rare female dedicated um, MCU movie. I don't feel like we got that, but it was fine. I, 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 I watched it in theater and I, and I don't feel the need to, to own it, to watch it again. The, um, and, and real quick at, at this point for anybody listening or watching students or people not in the class who, who listen to this or watch this, um, obviously we are going to talk about spoilers and kind of what, what we think is going to happen in the future of the MCU. So 
Um, I, I, I think I, I typically you have to say that at the beginning. So maybe I'll add that to the introduction. Um, so people don't get upset. Um, but I, I'm sure those will come. And Lisa, I remember reading your post about the end credit scene of Black Widow. And the first time I watched Black Widow and the end credit scene came up, I thought, oh yeah, I forgot. After the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, there was a report that Val was originally going to or debut in Black Widow. So that was kind of, yeah, that end credit scene didn't really shed that much light onto things because we knew she was in it already. We knew Florence Pugh was going to be in the Hawkeye series. Um, but did any, and someone did share this on, on the spoiler page. Um, I had seen it from someone else, but someone shared it to the, the spoiler group page. Um, did anyone see the article that, um, about like Val being a, a villain or not being a villain based in, on, on that, um, in credit scene. Did anybody see that article? And I, I don't want to, I don't want to say anything if you don't want to kind of have possibly a look into what could happen. So if anybody has any objections to that, stop me now and we'll just move on. Okay. So here's something that was really, really interesting to me because the first time I watched the end credit scene, I thought, okay, not the best one I've seen. Okay. It, it, it was not having. J. Jonah Jameson, um, like, spill who Spider-Man was, for sure. Then I read this article that when Knives Out came out in theaters, Ryan Johnson, the director of Knives Out, said Apple has a, an agreement that bad characters don't use their products on screen in movies. And so this article said, you know, when... Val pulls out the tablet, that's an iPad. And that presumably is her personal iPad. So, and when I read that, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like all of a sudden my my, um, kind of perception of that in credit scene like skyrocketed. Cause I'm like, was that, I I don't think they do things unintentional. I don't really, there, there are slip ups here and there but I don't think something like that would be unintentional. Is that something that one, they are pointing to, okay, here's her future in the MCU. And it kind of points to, you know, what people have discussed of maybe she's putting together sort of another type team that's sort of on the fringe, but helps most of the time, things like that. Or also there's, you know, there's the possibility, have those agreements changed? Um, Has something happened to that agreement? And now they're able to use uh, they're they're able to use that with any character, not just just good characters versus bad characters. Um, so that was really really interesting to me, and that's kind of that that where fandom for me meets like um, branding and consumer behavior, which is what I talk about and write about a lot um, outside of like this class and my my other research. Um, so that was really really interesting to me. I, I'm I'm glad you brought that one up. Um, cause it reminded me of that. It's um, interesting. I, I hadn't known about that contract. I want to, I want to read about that. That's interesting. Um, and new rock stars, actually, I remember after this, the scene was released, I remember them saying tongue in cheek. It didn't sound like they knew about anything official, just tongue in cheek saying like, bad guys don't use iPads. <laughs> and it was a little like unsettling to see like the notch, like in her hand, like, I, yeah. Like, I guess we, if there is a contract in place, it must be working because like, I, I definitely at least was like unsettled by seeing a, someone I thought was a villain holding a tablet with a notch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, I, and, go ahead, Sarah. So I've heard that rumor as well, that there is a thing, not allowed to use Apple products if you are a good person. And that was my like thing that brought me out of Black Widow for a hot second because she uses a Nokia phone. It, when she's like on the ship heading to Norway and I was like oh but she's supposed to be the hero why is she using Nokia hmm. so that that was a moment I didn't notice in the end scene that uh Val was using an iPad but 
I well, noticed that Black Widow was not using an iPhone. I, I didn't notice that. Uh, I didn't notice she was not using an iPhone or Apple products. Um, that's, I don't know. That was just, that's just something like to me, like that is my kind of mecca of fandom that like, oh, I, I learned this new thing. Like I, I need to, I want to tell everybody and then have to be careful not to tell too much. Um, Sarah, do you want to go ahead with your reactions and how the shows influenced your fandom? Yeah, I was also taking notes because we're just all over the place and it's so much fun. <laughs> um, I, of course, came from it of the perspective, so many lovely characters of color, so many characters that are women, they all have agency, they're all going places, making their own decisions. I think just about all these movies and TV shows passed the Bechdel test, which could not be said for where we started with Iron Man 1. That was not a thing. <laughs> um, I felt seen and I felt heard. I felt like these were themes for the significant societal changes that we are facing today. And that's what pop culture is supposed to do, is take what's going on and make it make sense in an artistic way. Um, so for... Falcon and Winter Soldier, I saw the theme of power and especially the theme of masculinity, like how masculinity looks different in America now and how we're going through that together of what, what do American men look like right now, especially when they are in service to a country in various ways. Um, Loki obviously was a lot of free will, like do we have that agency? Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes things are just beyond our control which is something Loki refuses to believe. And I was like, man, love that, love that. Um, with WandaVision, we had the theme of escapism, which is especially interesting given how much time we have all been streaming Netflix, Disney+, Plus, HBO, et cetera. YouTube, lots of stuff on, just so much content and we're all trying to escape all the time. So I thought that was brilliantly timely. Um, and Black Widow, yeah, I also just kind of had a hey, um, I really was not into how much tragedy this character has gone through. Like that, that was the theme I saw. Like with WandaVision, she really balanced comedy and tragedy, which made it a little bit more fun to hang around. But Black Widow was just trauma and sadness for a lot of it. And I was like, Oof. Um, but also the theme of found family, like what does it mean to have people that you are absolutely not related to and have those be your closest people? So that was interesting. But um, yeah, I, I, when it comes to female-led superhero movies, I really felt like the sense of Wonder Woman with her Amazons was a lot more girl power behind it. Like, yes, we're all the team, let's go. And then Captain Marvel, she was like, yeah, I do what I want. I don't care. I'm a team player, but I'm also very solo. So I felt like of the three big superhero movies you've had, Black Widow was not quite my favorite. And I feel really bad saying it. Like I wanted to love it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I the I I listened to um MCU fan show um with, with Sean Gerber's one of the, the hosts. And um like with all these shows, I it's like I watch the show and I also, I, I, I am able to work with things on in the background. So I'm, I'm watching and consuming these shows many, many times. Same thing with Black Widow. And then when they will do spoiler, excuse me, reviews of the episodes. And so I'll listen to them. And I feel like I, I come out of those, like, just feeling like I know more about the stories and how they're unfolding. Um, one of the themes that was pointed out, um, not just in that show, but in other things that I read with Black Widow was human trafficking, which I didn't pick up on at first. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm interested to know, and then Ryan, we'll get to your reactions as well. Um, I, I'm interested to know, did anybody pick up on that theme on first watch because after I read about it and listened to it then like I have it on premiere access so every time that I watch it like it's a very strong theme that I, I pull out of that movie now but the the first time that I watched it in that intro 
I wasn't able to pick up on that as much because I was so just kind of invested in what the story was going to be moving forward. Yeah, they had lots of little girls in storage containments. Like it was human trafficking for sure. I, yeah, that's why I was like, oh, wow. Okay, this is how we're starting a movie. Hey, okay. And then if I may slip one more other thing in, like I was also, you know, out of the 90s, I didn't really have an education on the Cold War, like at all. Like I was born at the tail end of it, never came up in school. And so watching that, I was like, oh my God, I know nothing. I know nothing. What is going on? I should have like had a prereq course before I started Black <laughs> Widow. <laughs> like that is how I felt jumping into this movie as well. Now I had watched the Americans, the TV show, the Americans. So like, as soon as they showed like this family, I was like, I know exactly what's happening right now um, because of that. But they also speak, speaking to the human trafficking. I mean, Scarlett Johansson's character, Black, she was bought, right? So that's a huge issue with buying children from impoverished families, just so that some people, so they can live, you know, um, so the other family can live, so they can get money. They sell one of their children, and then they can have the rest. That's, I mean, that's a huge problem in third world countries, and you know, it's 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 a serious issue. And the human trafficking aspect is, and it's weird that it's so far in the background. Like, I mean, it's like that's pretty big deal. I don't know why this wasn't like more of an important full frontal. This is an issue here, um, but. And anyone else? And then if not, well, go, okay, then Ryan, go ahead and um, just give us your overall reactions to the shows. And then also that how you think it's influenced your fandom. Sure. I can transition good because I can tell, I can openly admit now, I haven't seen Black Widow yet. <laughs> um, so you guys are talking, so you're asking me for any of my feedback and I'm like, eh, I don't have anything because I haven't watched it because um, I am an educator and us educators are frugal. Uh, I'm not I'm not paying the $30 for Premier Access Disney. I'm waiting until October 6th. Yeah, I know the date in my head, and then I'll watch the movie um, on Disney Plus. So anyway, I, I haven't watched it yet, uh, but I'm excited to still watch it. But uh, really getting into these shows like Disney Plus, <clears throat> though, I, I, and being that frugal line too, like I originally thought I was like, I, I'm not a, I don't have Netflix account. I don't, I don't have anything extra. I don't, we, we have cable, but that's about it. Like that's our splurge. So when Disney Plus came out, I was like, ah, I guess I, I, you know, I've got most of these tapes again, kids on VHS, um, sitting in my closet. That's how, uh, you know, I got Lady and Tramp, Mary Pot, all of them, they're all in there. So I was like, what do I need Disney Plus for? And then they got me on like this idea of Mandalorian. I'm a Star Wars fan of too as well. Um, so like that Mandalorian line, I was like, oh my god, this is incredible. And then things like imagineering and stories and like this looks behind the scene that that's my jam so i was like i'm in this so um and then once i got in and dove in it's it's been incredible and now they probably got me hooked for life um paying for the streaming service but um you know uh that's that's kind of where i kind of started my excitement and then the mcu movies that are these little series i guess it's kind of been a, like a love hate for me for mcu because i love the stories so much um and the movies uh, that's what I love about them is there's so many storylines and characters being developed and so many layers of stories on top of each other. But it's also the part that's most frustrating to me because I want to know all the answers, which leads me to dive deeper and, and find out like what is going on. The, like backstory is huge in Disney period, like theme parks, backstory and all that stuff. And it's huge in these movies, right? The backstories all play a part in these characters developing and the storylines. And it's very intertwined. Almost think of it as like the... Uh, the uh, sacred timeline, right? It's a lot of stuff going on at one time. So it can be overwhelming uh, and you miss a ton the first time through. And that aggravates me because I'm like trying to watch everything. I mean, I'm so bad that I will, uh, if I don't understand their um, dialogue, I'll put on the closed caption so I can read it. <laughs> um, so uh, so that's, that's where I'm at. So, so going into WandaVision and stuff, uh, being the first one being released, I, I kind of had this, mindset of it's going to be mcu right it's going to be this massive blown out multi storylines uh and i didn't like it the first couple because i was like mm, this is not this is very it, on, on a lot of levels relatively speaking to mcu it's uh it's simplistic 
it's is it really just this story of Wanda being completely like having a breakdown over losing basically her uh, her partner in, in Vision and then also friends as well uh, that she lost uh, that she's been going to battle with over the last years um, is it really that simplistic and I was waiting for it to be bigger and then you know it's it's obviously I respect their whole play on just doing something completely different and how can you not love something that starts out with uh, a reference basically themed on um, the Dick Van Dyke show, which is another side tangent. I, I, when I was growing up and Mary Poppins is one of my favorite movies, I wanted Dick Van Dyke or his character there to be, to be my dad. So I love Dick Van Dyke. Uh, so, so that, so that kept me in it. I was going to be in it regardless, to be honest, but so I stayed with it and then I was like, okay, here we go. You know, it builds steam a little bit and it got me going. And so, um, Wanda, uh, WandaVision really, I did really enjoy it. And my wife got into it, which she's not at the same level in the MCU as, as I am uh, in her passion for it. But again, I guess if I, you know, just like anything else, if, if you love something, your, your wife will tend to pick up on stuff. And I was like, well, do you want to watch this with me? She's like, oh, sure. There's been a lot of talk about it. So she was interested, in it, but then she got into it. She got into the story. And of course it's got that love steam thing and she's really into that stuff. So she wanted to know more about what is what is vision what like you know explain that gets a little bit tricky like it's not he's not a human he's not you know um that kind of stuff for people that haven't seen the backstory so i i loved all that part of it um and even her like going on into the her stuff that i grew up with like full house and modern family more recently and just the fact that her sisters were in full house like that kind of quirky stuff i loved um falcon uh and the winter soldier uh, I'm kind of on the same lines as most everybody here and Lisa was talking about a little bit just it was it was an MC it was an MCU type style movie that storyline that we're used to um, except again one track uh, which I liked again I, I liked that a little bit because it gave me a break from trying to massively figure out you know a million things at once and like a scene that lasts less than 20 seconds you know you're like what is going on here um so i like that idea of it that's simple but then it was mostly just action and some character development which i appreciated and i enjoyed it but it was again I, it wasn't something that sent me off on a bunch of tangents to try to figure out stuff so it wasn't as complex wandavision did have a ton of hidden things and they, they all do because that's just what they're going to do in these movies or shows um but uh WandaVision was definitely more complex when you start looking at like um, Rambo and that storyline and her mom. And there's there's some rabbit holes you go down there. A little less that I knew about, at least I figured out in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which again, I liked a little bit because it helped. It's a nice reprieve from always being trying to figure out what, you know, what rabbit hole I got to jump down next. Uh, but then my all-time favorite of the ones that come out by far is Loki. Uh, I loved it. Um, I was in, I was hooked from the very second I was hooked from the trailer. Uh, I love this idea of like another side note is I love the idea of old tech and new tech intertwined in this whole retro feel of the TVA. Um, I love the whole, like I knew going into, uh, again, what Lisa said, I knew that uh, this is a pre, this is really the show of the shows that's really going to set the stage for the next phase. Um, it really, that, that was the intent, at least that's what, most people are talking about this is going to like really go back and explain what's going on with these multiverses which is a big part of the next phase so i was i was really into seeing and trying to understand this concept that gets really really you know um sciencey and nerdy which again up my alley uh, and this idea of multiverses and and everything else going on and i love the end uh i thought i didn't know who kang was again not being a big comic guy so i had to go back and figure out what this was and then to find out like you can go back and see like when he's in the um the study at the end that the, you know the last scene in the study so again yeah you mentioned spoilers so we'll talk about <laughs> at the end when the, the loki's are the two loki's are there um confronting him and if you look around he's got a, a tons of books in there but he's also got artifacts scattered around and he's got the iron man helmet up on the shelf which was like a lot of times i think well some of these things are just thrown in there um but you have to look into them a little bit to figure it out uh, what's going on and there's like this whole story of Kang like you can go back and and basically if you think about it he's he is a master of right uh, of time and time kind of this um, understanding of the uh, the, the loop um, like the, the sacred timeline as they call it um, and if you think back into the regular MCV movies you know Iron Man Tony Stark is the one that develops this tech and so if there's a connection there 
between Kang and Iron Man. There's like a respect. Um, and then there's a, even a comic book series, which uh, there's this Kang goes back and is a young version of himself mm-hmm. as um, I forget what his name is, like a young Iron Man or Iron Man's, uh, you know, kind of like his, his Robins, his Batman, kind of the jump uh, uh, universe is there for a second. But uh, basically going back, trying to recreate himself in another universe as a better him. So there's this huge tie between Iron Man and Kang, which I would have never known if I didn't jump down that. And and the idea of like the tech even looks the same on the wrist. It's just modified a little bit to back to what they wore when they were jumping and um, um, end game and different times and stuff. So uh, that's the stuff that kind of drives me. So I love Loki. Loki, Loki's kind of was like, I was kind of like, dang, because I know um, uh, Black Widow is obviously out now and it was the next one that came out very soon, but it doesn't follow the same storyline structure, right? It's not in that, doesn't fit where we're, we're kind of at now. And so I'm just like dying to get the next part of this story. Um, so it did its job. So so I think that's what it was meant to do for the fans was like, okay, get us excited get us chomping at the bit for where we're going. And, you know, I thought it did that. So I loved it. Well, and two things on Loki. Um, does anybody watch the, uh, what are they? Mar- um, Marvel assembled or mm-hmm. what, yeah, the making assembled. of the shows? Assembling a universe or. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they. Um, Forget who you're talking to here. <laughs> the way that the Loki one, Tom, you could tell Tom Hiddleston was like a producer of that episode and i i really really enjoyed watching that making of episode because of the way everything was like because of the way everything was approached and you know he had the the transitions and everything that he would talk about um that was really really interesting and and i think with the other thing i was going to say on loki is just the uh how at the end, I was so invested in like Loki and Sylvie's story that when, you know, when she pushes him through the portal at the end, like that was a big downer for me. And, and then on second and third watch, I was like, well, yeah, you, you come to the realization that, well, if this storyline is going to move forward, this is what has to happen that you know here's she basically opened up the next you know i've seen memes about opening up the next 10 years of marvel content and and what's going to happen with not only kane but what's going to happen with all the other movies and kind of bringing things together which is really really fun and really interesting the the next thing um that i asked i want to say one more thing about loki just because i forgot and i thought that this was really cool um well, it's cool to me because I think it touches home. And I know you like the character uh, development piece. Uh, your paper talks a lot about that with Loki. And you mentioned some of this stuff. But one thing that Loki the series did, which I, I think it really hit home, was this idea of what we perceive as ourselves and what is perception from others, mm-hmm. often very different things. <laughs> and I, I love watching Loki battle through this idea of what he really his side of the story you got to see more of like his internal thoughts of where he's coming from and you know how he honestly feels like he is a good guy um and sometimes but then realizing then from other people's perceptions mostly sylvie's uh too and and i think he probably uh, appreciates hers more uh her her because uh owen wilson's character gives him a lot of feedback too but he's not receptive to it right and then towards the end sylvia is giving him kind of the same feedback and he's more receptive to it from her uh, maybe because they're the same i guess to person but uh in some sense of the, of the word but anyway he kind of realizes that maybe i'm i'm not the greatest maybe this is all not the greatest decisions i've made in the past and i realize that i love that part of this story i mean i i really i really got into that too so yeah and the, it's a good transition to talk about some of the themes covered because like looking at the shows marvel has and 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 somebody mentioned it earlier that these the stories and the themes marvel is dealing with now were not it was sarah was not present in when iron man was released and you can make the argument that with iron man they just needed to see if something was going to work and they just had to keep making these 
these movies the way that they would to see if they were going to work. And then when they kind of started catching on, then they could be a little more adventurous, if you will, in the, their theming. Um, but these, you come to current, these Disney Plus shows are, and, and, and Black Widow with like the human trafficking and, and finding family, they're telling some really deep themes, which if you, if you read about them, they're not all that different from what Marvel, the publisher, was doing um, originally. I mean, they were very uh, kind of, I guess, if you want to say forward thinking or, or not afraid to approach some of these topics. Now, obviously, they did, they did things that um, weren't appropriate, um, but they also were approaching some of these topics. So it's really, really interesting. Some of the themes that are covered in these shows, like loss and grief and WandaVision and, and the, what masculinity is and what race relations are in the United States and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Um, moving on to that, um, the, the freedom of choice and in Loki, like at the end, it reminded me of what Spider-Man always says about, or what Spider-Man's told, I guess, um, with great power comes great responsibility because it's like, yes, if you have the agency to make your own decisions, there's also whatever decision you make, there are these unintended consequences and, and they could be good, they could be negative, but something's going to come from every decision that we make. Um, and I also, I read after the show, kind of the, the a theming of, of self-love, which was in, in self-love and Loki, um, which kind of was cased, you know, by Mobius saying, you know, how big of a, like how full of yourself are you that you fell in love with yourself when he's like talking to Tom Hiddleston um, at the TVA. But I'm interested to, to get your reactions on some of the themes that were covered. And so why don't we, um, give, me, give me two or three themes that really stuck out to each one of you um, throughout the stories and throughout um, Black Widow. Um, any, any of the themes that, that you thought were interesting? Lisa, we'll go ahead and start with you. So, I mean, I think the flow has been really interesting through all of the MCU, of course, you know, phase one to me was all about sort of, you know, responsibility and owning your own choices. Um, the, again, the great, with great power comes great responsibility, whether it's Captain America learning to make decisions for himself or Iron Man becoming, you know, a responsible adult, or, you know, you can kind of go through all of phase one and, and think about that. Um, in, in, number, in phase two, I think they were thinking more about sort of what makes a villain, what makes a hero, what does heroism mean, you know, what's the sympathetic villain, um, and, and delving into that. I think, you know, phase three was a lot about legacy to me, to kind of, you know, what do you leave behind at the end is really kind of wrapping, out, wrapping up that, that first sort of bundle um, of characters. And, you know, what I've seen since then, and it might be why it grips me, because it feels a lot more human in phase four. Um, so, you know, the, the, the things that really hit me were, you know, grief and family and identity and really just exploring, like, from a really philosophical standpoint, right? Like, what makes a person? What makes a family? Um, you know, WandaVision was about Wanda and her synthesoid husband, who she manifested from her own mind, and her children. And yet we're crying at the end, right, when they're, when they're separated. Um, you know... What, what, what makes a person, what makes a sentient being, um, you know, what is grief? Of course, WandaVision dealt with that better than anything I've ever seen. Um, so that, I mean, and, and, and looking at all that, again, that might be why this phase is, is touching us as much of it is, as it is, because it's, it is very human. Um, and while it's tackling some really big topics like, you know, race and, um, uh, race and human trafficking and you know all these sort of big topics um that they bring in like the like like brian i think you said you know like, like marvel has always done from the beginning they've brought in you know meaningful social social topics and, and spoke their piece on it um but at the core it just feels very it feels smaller to me um 
you know, it feels more more about people and grief and really sort of asking real questions about what makes a person and what makes a family. Um, you know, and the family thing, I think, runs throughout, definitely runs throughout phase four so far. Um, and uh, as you all know from talking to me before, I'm not, if I say I put a pin in something to remember later, I don't. So I'm going to jump in now and anybody can can respond to this. Lisa, you made a really good point about how it feels very human. It, it's There are these major themes that they are dealing with, but there are also the theme of loss, the, the theme of what, um, like we talked about what masculinity is. These things that on an every everyday people deal with constantly. And it made me think, are the Disney Plus shows, the longer form narratives, are they kind of, I guess, are you, are they better able to tell those stories using that format rather than a two, two and a half hour movie that's kind of one and done and you have to make sure you get the the hero story, a little bit of the villain story, the big fight at the end and all of this. Whereas in these Disney Plus shows, you can stretch it out and you can have more of that character development. Um, how much difference do you think that makes that, that these are the, the, between the Disney Plus shows and then the big theatrical or tent pole productions? I think it's massively different, honestly. And especially if you look at the endings too, I mean, a lot of the movies wrap everything up in a nice neat bow and that's what it is. It's this standalone thing that can, can sit there by itself. You get the whole story beginning to end and then it's done. But these shows are broader and in the sense that they're, they're spawning more stories than they're even telling. They, there's a lot of spinoff of this and there's a lot of unanswered questions. And I don't think that's something that we've really seen from Marvel before. We get hints of it in some of the end credit scenes where you're like, oh, look what's coming. But I think the shows are really, they're telling the stories, but they're also branching out and spawning a lot more stories of what could possibly be and they're not wrapping up the shows in the nice neat little bow there's not a happy ending for everybody there's not even an ending for everybody because these people are still living life still going so i think that the disney shows are uniquely situated to do something like this over the movies sarah go ahead i agree with 100 percent of what you just said um having six hours to digest something rather than two and a half, maybe if you stretch it. Um, but the other thing that Jamie also mentioned was we are getting these weekly. Like we are digesting it an hour at a time. And it's just like, oh, that is not something that we have really had to do in a while with Netflix, et cetera. Um, like I, I know you can still watch TV shows weekly if you really want to, but who does that? No one. But Disney makes you. <laughs> That's something that I find really interesting is they give you just enough to keep you busy and to chew on until next week. And then it, yeah, I, yes, yes. And I think that's why WandaVision blew up the way that it did, yeah. right? Because if I had watched, if I had binge watched WandaVision on a Sunday afternoon, you know, I, I would have not gotten into the comics at all. It was because I loved it so much. We were talking about it so much. And I found myself, like I said, like running to YouTube to fill the gap and then running to the actual comics to fill the gap. And, and I came out of WandaVision, like I, and I would go into the next episode with all of this like new ammo of what I was expecting to see. And um, yeah, there's there's no way that WandaVision would have had the cultural power and pull that it did if it hadn't been released as a slow burn. Yeah, and you know, I, when when Disney first started doing that with Mandalorian, I know there were a lot of, there were articles written about like streaming versus weekly release and kind of one of the being cynical people writing cynically about it is, well, you do a weekly release because then you release it over two months and people at least have to pay two months of a subscription. However, it is when something's released on a weekly basis, you do have to think about it because you can't consume the next thing. So you're either thinking about it 
Maybe you choose to watch it again. Maybe you choose to read about it. Maybe you choose to, you know, yeah, like multiple times. I mean, they, and it kind of goes back to something that I always think of, you know, like the company and Walt Disney and everybody talked about, has always talked about educating or people learning without knowing that they're being exposed to things. Or if you can teach something without somebody knowing they're supposed to be learning something, that's a real gift. And, and people have called it edutainment and things like that as well. That yes, these shows, they, they, once an episode is over, a lot of times you're just like, what did I just, what just happened? Like what, and you, you have to sit and you have to like, let it marinate for a week about what, what happened? What does that actually mean? And then at the same time, you're probably reading some other things, getting some more insight into all of this, um, which to me is, is what is really, really so interesting about these shows. So um, Sarah, why don't you give us two or three things that stuck out to you? Sure. Um, I, I really love WandaVision. It's not a secret. We all do. Um, but really the balance of comedy and tragedy, like she really does a good job of weaving those two together throughout the entire story. And I don't, well, I know I'm not alone. We all want a spinoff of Darcy and Dr. Wu because that would be excellent. Um, and I really also got into Falcon and Winter Soldier, just inequities, who's making decisions about who. Like that is very anthropological that is basically what we talk about in school forever um and it is just i didn't expect to see that in a mainstream tv show with superheroes i was like disney went there and we're staying here we're going to talk about this okay like i i did not i was completely just surprised blown away excited that Falcon said all the stuff that he'd been waiting to say. <laughs> and especially like when um, he's talking to the, I don't remember, the, the politicians, those guys, after he's rescued them, it's like, you guys understand that you are not like actually good guys, right? Um, like this person you've painted as a terrorist, she is really going through some stuff. Like y'all maybe need to work it out. And I was like, power and equity in Falcon and Winter Soldier just blew me away. And, you know, it, the, after I watched Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I went back and I read the, um, the truth, red, white, and black is the name of the, the series about Isaiah Bradley, because I wanted to learn more about Isaiah Bradley. And it was, it was really, really good story. Um, and it, it really is like a, a very heavy theme um, that they were telling in that story and it's it's again one of those things that people watch it and at first you may not think that's what you're seeing and that's what you're potentially being exposed to from these stories but then you have that week or you have that that time period afterwards and you're you're like oh yeah that's that's what that's where they were going with this so um ryan real quick you want to touch on two or three themes that stuck out to you yeah and i mean i've, I've kind of already talked about it a little bit so i mean i i really enjoy and this is goes you can pick anything i talked about it with loki but it's, it's, it's a theme throughout the whole character development of any marvel thing is this the idea of self-discovery right so this hero's journey hero's arc that they go through um and what i love about some of the shows like wandavision and falcon and the winter soldier loki etc is you get to dive a little bit into like the not so great areas right like it, in the movies um the, the grandeur just because of time and all that and production costs you got to be like bang like here's here's a tragedy boom and they're and they like it seems like the next hour they're they've learned from it and they've moved on and here in these stories you can see this slow drag a little bit more natural um idea or of like um Jamie was saying too, not always resolved. Like with Wanda, she's not, <laughs> there's no resolution there with, she's still grieving. Um, and even maybe more now because she had something that she created, whether 
um, truth or not, it is now been taken from her again. Um, I mean, even the end credit scene there, you know, she hears her her kids in one of the multiverses, uh, presumably, um, and so there's a there's a tie and there's something there. So 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 not always resolved even. But so I like that idea of the, this development this, and the slow burn of it and kind of working through the, the arc. And then my kind of leads into my other favorite theme in, in all these movies is the the persistence of these characters to keep going right when things that's the way we live our life right things happen and we have to keep going we have to pick ourselves up dust ourselves off and, and keep moving uh and these these characters obviously because it's a it's a story and movie um they go through some pretty dramatic stuff and and just watching them pick themselves up and then the the humor side of it the humanistic side of it being that they still have to deal with other things. And I love how Marvel weigh, weighs that in. Like they work that in a little bit. Like, you know, um, you see the Falcons still have to deal with the fact that his, you know, parents shipping uh, or a fishery boat needs to be repaired. And you know, that, that old sideline when he's like got some really massive things on his plate, he's still got to make room for um, the everyday Joe kind of problems that we deal with. Um, because they're human. So I love how they do that too. So those are some of my favorite things that that, that I've enjoyed over the, the past years here with Marvel. Okay. Theme-wise. And then Jamie, the themes that stuck out to you? Um, I really enjoyed how they portrayed love and love in all its different forms throughout all of these shows. So, I mean, you've got WandaVision. Um, you know, well, tr- traditional disney you've got love portrayed as something that can over love can overcome anything it'll it'll all be okay with if you just love or persevere but you can see with wandavision that message is a little toxic um she loves these she loves her husband she loves vision so much that she has damaged this whole town psychologically has taken them hostage and that's a that's terrible it's a really horrible thing that she does we kind of we understand where she's coming from with her grief and you know i love the quote grief what is grief but love persevering but it also is kind of like at this point love can't overcome right this is wrong that you're doing this we understand that you're doing it out of love for this person and for you know your children that don't exist but it's wrong so when you get this different message of love there and then when you've got falcon and the winter soldier they both love steve but you can also tell they're they're both kind of mad at him too because he's kind of abandoned them but then you know they also have this you know sam going through he loves his country even though it's not perfect it does have a problematic history he still loves his country and wants to represent it despite its flaws um and then you have these two guys who have this friendship who doesn't start as a friend they're just called co-workers <laughs> and then it, that that relationship grows and then you've got loki discovering you know he thinks he's burdened with glorious purpose and he comes to realize more about about himself he learns to you know love himself and his relationship with sylvie also kind of demonstrates that that self-love like understanding coming to terms with who you are and that it's not all about you necessarily um but i think that they've done a really good job of kind of telling these stories through you know this emotion yeah and i i think the just kind of to to sort of wrap up maybe this section of it is again, the comics have, they've always dealt with some pretty strong themes and they weren't really afraid to, they made some mistakes, but they weren't afraid to get into some of these conversations as well. Um, And so if you, you know, if you ask the executives at Marvel, they would say they're just following the comics. But I mean, one of the really, really cool things about, how popular culture influences consumers and just people in society is that notion that whereas someone would be maybe hesitant or resistant to looking into a theme such as grief or what is masculinity, what's toxic relationships, what is, um, you know, like uh, race relations or, or all of these themes that are being talked about, what's self-love and self-acceptance. 
someone who would be resistant to doing that, well, all of a sudden, if they're watching these shows and they're enjoying these shows, then they are learning about those themes. And I just wonder how many people watching a show like, uh, like Loki, if people picked up on the theme of, well, this, there's a theme of self-love in here or self-acceptance. I've, Loki had, has done some things in his past that he has to come to terms with, but that doesn't dictate who he has to be in the future. And, you know, Mobius says it in, I think the fifth up fourth episode that he can be whoever he wants to be just in case no one's ever told you that before. I wonder if people watching that, who maybe that's their theme that they struggle with, they don't want to see that about themselves. Um, if that kind of opened themselves up to that, um, because if that did, that is to me like something really, really cool that um, popular culture can do and, and, and these stories can do because it's such a big franchise now that, you know, it's almost like Marvel is saying, okay, let's, let's more so than we have in the past, because now we can, let's take a look in the mirror and let's take a look at all of these things that we all need to deal with um, on a molecular level, personal level, but, you know, bigger levels as well. Um, so the, the last topic, before we do the, the rapid fire questions, the last topic um, I asked everybody to, to think about, and so the students knowing that know this, um, everybody on this panel, they're kind of doing something similar to what, what you're doing in your assignment. People who aren't in the class who are listening to this, I can uh, link to that information if anybody's interested so you can watch this. But the MCU, or... I guess the popularity of Marvel was built on the premise that these characters live in our world. Um, obviously, we don't look outside of our door and see Spider-Man swinging from telephone poles, things like that. But these characters are living in our worlds and they're dealing with human problems. And that was one of the things that was most, that made Marvel so popular and helped people make sense of things such as um, the United States involvement in wars. I mean, Captain America issue number one shows him um, on the cover um, punching Adolf Hitler, actually. And, you know, uh, the, the tie between the Fantastic Four and the space race and Iron Man and the Cold War and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And they were used to teach us about our worlds or about our surrounding and also could teach us about ourselves. And so what we do in the class is the students, um, they, they, they read a, a paper that was actually a faculty essay I wrote for the Journal of Undergraduate Research. They read that, that basically goes through um, describing how you can use MCU characters to kind of get inspiration from, try to attain something, um, and you can, you can use them to kind of identify with, but you can also identify with the fact that their stories and their story arcs change. They don't end at the end of a movie, just like, as Ryan pointed out earlier, a person lives day to day. I mean, we have to, you know, we have to keep going. And so it's a fun thing that we get to do as a class to talk about which MCU character or characters represent you or you want to represent you. It doesn't, it can be someone to, to reach for or try to attain. Um, and so I asked everybody here to, to kind of think about that as well and so we can go um uh let's go ahead and start with sarah um what mcu character or characters you think represent you or you draw inspiration from well first off i just want to say very difficult decision but <laughs> so many good characters to pick from i want to be like most of them um, but I settled on Peggy Carter, like, 
fan favorite. She's perfect. She can do no wrong in my eyes. Um, but what I really love about her is that she doesn't really have superpowers. Like there is nothing super about Peggy. She's just a boss. She is a human who gets stuff done. She is thriving wherever she's planted, wherever she happens to find herself. Like, and she also, like, if something is broken, like she will fix it or she will build something even better. And that is like, who doesn't want to do that? Just like make the world a better place because it can and you have the power to do so. Love Peggy. All right, awesome. Um... Let's go ahead, Jamie, why don't you go next? Um, so mine is Nick Fury. Um, I identify with Nick Fury a lot because I'm a big planner. I'm very strategic in my decisions, you know, for life or just something as basic as like planning a vacation. Like I, I plan a lot, I make strategic decisions. Um, and he inspires me too, because he inspires a lot of loyalty. And all, I mean, you think of how much, how loyal like Maria Hill is to him, how loyal Steve Rogers is to him. And so he is just a regular human too, trying to do the best that he can. He made mistakes and that's, that's very human thing to do. We make mistakes, we just try to make it better. And, you know, maybe that not everybody understands every decision that he makes, but he's making the best decisions that he can in the plans that he he has for the future and what he's trying to do the right thing um trying to protect you know the earth um or the america just depending on which organization we're talking about he's the head of at the moment um so yeah so nick fury is mine I, I i really identify with him i'd like to be more like him i'd like to you know inspire um more people to have better leadership qualities but i also identify with him as a you know a planner a strategic thinker um and somebody's just trying to do the best that they can okay all right, Lisa. Um, so I didn't think about this so much as like who I thought I was like or was inspired by as just as much as who I connected with. Um, and I'm just going to go with Wanda uh, or Scarlet Witch. Um, so going back to the very beginning, you know, not knowing really what the source of her power is, um, but then she's coming into this power and, uh, you know, having to balance it against this incredibly horrifically tragic life and then this you know, these, these monumental moments of grief um, and kind of watching her learn about, you know, grief and processing grief and how to balance that against the power of, you know, the responsibilities that come with her power, you know, and then at the end of the day, just kind of balancing between um, the responsibilities to her family and her love for her family and her responsibilities to the world around her. Um, and, you know, that's just a very sort of classic juggling act that I think we all have to play. Um, clearly not on such a grand scale, um, but just in seeing her literally have to choose between what she very much believed and felt were her children and her husband, um, you know, and, and this, this town and the world, the greater, you know, the, the greater world um, and have to make that choice. Um, yeah, it, it, it just, it just connected and resonated with me more than maybe your typical superhero. Yeah. And I mean, you, you get a glimpse of why this is such a fun conversation to have in the class because mm -hmm. everybody so far has you you have i the the people you identify with your reasoning is different from probably five other people who identify with that same character um which is what is so fun about this um it, it's such a great time getting to talk about this and ryan i know we we've done this before um, but can you share a character or characters that you yeah. identify with? Yeah, I feel like you added that rule because we did do this before and I couldn't zero down on one character. So you, this is the uh, Ryan clause that lets me get to say more than one, one character. But yeah, and I actually did try to do this again, this, this kind of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, practice, whatever, figuring out let me look at all the characters again and see if I can come up with some different ones that I said, I think you said they're going to listen to this later on my interview later. So they, they won't, they'll hear this again, I guess. But it, the funny thing is I went back down to it and I still came back to the same two. Um, I, I might've said more in, in yours, but I've narrowed it down to two at least now. And the first one is, is Captain America, Steve Rogers, basically because I am a rule follower, almost to my wife's, uh, 
teasing or dismay because I'll, I'm the guy that still turns on my blinker out in the middle of nowhere on a dirt road to turn right and there's nobody around. Uh, so I will do that and I will follow. I'm kind of, I'm like that, but like Steve, I I've evolved over my time and I've grown to understand when rules should be bent and when they, um, maybe aren't, uh, what we are told is the best um, for everybody. So that's kind of guided me in my education. I always ask myself the question, if I am if I don't know if I should be doing something in the classroom or not, I just ask myself, is this what's best for kids? And if the answer is yes, I do it. So kind of a little mirror to what Steve um, has there uh, in his, his uh, growth as well. Um, and then my other one is uh, Shuri from Black Panther, who is a scientist and I can just relate to and hope to actually aspire because she's just in as the characters go in the MCU world, um, probably one of the smartest <laughs> uh, problem solvers, incredibly persistent when things don't go well for her or things aren't, she's following a, an idea or something. It's not quite working. She stays with it, keeps working. And she's obviously super creative, the tech that she's developing and using. Um, and she's very snarky and sarcastic, which is exactly how I am too. So I think we would get along. Um, she would, she would out genius me, but I'd love to learn from her. Um, and then I could, I could equal her in her sarcasm and snarkiness. So I, that where I, where I, that's where I would stand on even ground with her, I think. So those are my two. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> and, and thank you for, for sharing those again. Um, I always love hearing about this when, when we talk about it in class. And so thank you for, um, for playing along with that. And, and talking about the the ones that you identify with or strive toward, um, I, I've I've always identified with Steve Rogers, Captain America, not because I feel like I am like kind of worthy of being a Steve Rogers or Captain America. It's more what he stands for, as far as kind of that loyalty to others and try to service to others. And, and I feel like that's something I like to try to reach um and then you know also at times when when you're trying to reach something and you and you fail to reach that kind of that perseverance to say okay here's what you could have done let's move on let's try to do better in the future not kind of wallowing in you know everything that, that you weren't able to do um so we all of you know i i've I end on some rapid fire questions. And when you all talked with me before, it was, um, they were focused on the parks. Obviously, since we've been talking about the three Disney Plus shows, um, and we'll throw Black Widow in there. Um, the, the ones that I have today um, are focused around that. And what we'll do just for time's sake, you, I'll throw out one. And then we'll just go in the same, we can go in the same order every time. Um, and I'll, I'll go on the order of my screen. So it'd be Jamie, Lisa, Ryan, and then Sarah um, is how everybody appears on my screen. And again, you could just give the answer. You could explain it if you want. You don't have to give any explanation if you want. Okay. So from these three Disney Plus shows and um, Black Widow, um, a favorite theme that you've had. Go ahead, Jamie. Um, I think WandaVision's expression of grief was my favorite. I mean, it was the saddest and most emotionally traumatizing, but it was the most impactful to me. Okay. All right, Lisa? Same. I mean, I'll say love and grief just to tack something else on, but um, but yeah, it's the same thing. No, no I can't think of a recent, like, um, line of dialogue that's affected me more than what is grief, but not love persevering, yeah. at least in recent times. Yeah. Ryan? Uh, I'm going to stick with my, when I said before, is Loki self-discovery. I just, I loved it and it's freshest in my mind. So that's mine. Okay. Sarah? I'm gonna, after hearing Jamie's argument, I'm going to go with love and all the kinds of love that we saw throughout all the shows, like self-love, friend love, sad love, I'm here for it. Okay. The The next one is um, your favorite character story throughout all of them. And it doesn't have to be the like the, the star of the show. It could be um, Darcy or it, it could be any character that you thought had a great story. I mean, like 
to me, Agatha Harkness was the best reveal. That was just an amazing reveal, even though for weeks we had been reading that that's, you know, that's probably who it would be. It was an amazing reveal. But favorite character story out of all of the stories, the shows, and the movies? Yeah, it's going to be Wanda. I'm okay. going gonna, I'm gonna to keep... I'm, no, I'm just gonna, every, every answer is going to be WandaVision. But just getting to see, like, her whole history, like, back to when she was a child, you know, and, you know, their escapism for watching the Dick Van Dyke show and Bewitched and, you know, learning about her history and how she became what she did and her struggles with grief, with her brother's death, with Vision's death, with everything. I mean, if there's not a poster child for PTSD, I don't know who else it would be. Like she's, she's struggled a lot, but she's still trying. She's still out there. She's still going. So I want this my favorite. Okay, Lisa. Um, I want to say Wanda. No, I'll Sorry. say Vision. No, that's fine. No, no, because I'll say Vision because I feel that just as strongly. Um, and it, it's it's so interesting because we weren't really we we're dealing with like a created version of him. Um, just to watch his sort of character arc from going from you know this perfect sort of um, form of the husband to be platonic about it um, to you know to to um, again, have, having you know, acquired his own identity, having his own thoughts, um, you know, re, um, you know be, becoming an, an aid to the person that created him. Um, the, the conversation with White Vision, which was beyond brilliant about the ship. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, Wanda is, is my easy answer. And I think it's probably what I would have said if I had gone first, but um, <laughs> I can stand behind Vision as well. Okay, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try, I'll switch gears because I've been Loki, Loki, Loki. So you guys heard that enough and I, and I kind of forgot um and some of the other panelists have been talking about falcon the winter soldier and it's just been replaying in my mind because it just seems it seems like so long ago when i watched it but um i can't i can't stop going back to sam's story so i think sam's character story just development there i mean that's a huge arc so going on again with a hero's theory i mean he he is dealing with a lot of big stuff and he where he starts uh, at and where he ends it, it just it's a lot of growth there for for the series so i'm gonna pick sam okay and sarah yeah it's sam obviously like <laughs> he goes through so much to become the captain america that steve knew he could be that bucky knew he could be but he had to get there his own way and there was a lot of stuff that steve and bucky didn't know about for him to feel worthy of the shield and once he got there like no one's taken that back from him i'm okay. I'm in awe of Sam. All right. The the next one is, and this is this is one I didn't share with everybody before, uh, because I wanted your just kind of on the spot reaction. Favorite end credit scene, and it, it could be in credit, mid credit. You know, in WandaVision there were several. Falcon and the Soldier and Loki there was one. Black Widow there was one. So do you have a favorite end or mid credit scene? Yeah, the the first end credit scene that we got with WandaVision. Okay. was my favorite that one was incredible because we were all just like oh my gosh okay go ahead lisa yeah the same i mean same. I've, i'm scrolling through them all in my head but that's the one and that that was kind of that that's sort of that typical in credit scene that you're like what is yeah, it left us with so many questions i think some <laughs> of the other ones obviously suffered from release order because the yeah. plan was yeah. a little different but um but yeah that was the one ryan yeah I, i'm gonna go with the the end credit scene in the last one of loki um where he looks up and sees kang is retaking the whatever those those guys that face was originally on there and kind of that reaction of that just because it it helps you know continue that excitement for the future mm -hmm. and sarah we'll go with the end of wandavision it's like Oh, this was a prequel. <laughs> yeah, we got so far to go. Well, you know, and one of the one of the things that on WandaVision, there's there's two things with um, a parent. Somebody had written that if you go back and you watch the end credit, the last end credit scene in WandaVision, now it's a little bit different than it was when it originally premiered on Disney Plus. And they're saying is that like a a sign of uh, like the multiverse 
changing, maybe people coming into that in credit scene. Um, it, it's it's really fun because it's one of those, to me, another sign of fandom that like people are going in and they're 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 delving in and they're getting these things. And the other thing about WandaVision and Loki, did anybody see the rumor of like somebody went and looked at the timestamps of those final episodes? And the timestamp, what is it when Wanda becomes um, the Scarlet Witch when they're in the battle? That's the same timestamp as when you look, when you watch Loki, the uh, he who remains kind of hearing that sound and saying like, now things have changed and now I don't know what's going to happen. And if that's intentional or not, it's, uh, it's just, I don't that takes a, a lot of planning. And I know the the MCU has planted seeds years in advance, but if that's intentional, wow, that's on a whole other level to get the timestamp exactly the same. But it, it's just another sign to me that somebody went and they're that big of a fan that they kind of made this argument around that, which is really, really fun to me. Um, I, I didn't know if anybody had had come up with that one. Uh, or had seen those. So moving forward, what story are you most looking forward to? They, it could be the movies coming out, the series coming out, or things that have been announced or been rumored, things that you're most looking forward to. Um, I think Kang the Conqueror as maybe the main villain of Phase 4. Um, I think that's going to be really interesting, and there's a lot of direction they can go with that because he's a major from what i understand he's a major character in the comic books and he has a lot of storylines and there's a lot of places that they can go with this particular villain um so i'm excited to see what they're going to do with him i know he's already been announced for dr strange um so that should be fun to see lisa um i mean i'm really excited for spider-man no way home just because i love that character and i think we're all like we have so many questions right now and that's going to be the first one when we can really start to search for answers and hidden answers and i'm sure we'll have a lot of fun with that when it comes out um but like you know probably more than that dr strange just because we're all so geared up after wandavision to see to see what's to come um and also after loki to see what's to come and it feels like you know kind of dr strange is where it's all going to come together um, and we're going to see the real direction that the phase is taking. Okay. Ryan? Yeah. And I, I'm kind of tying both of them back to, you know, Kang and that, that storyline of going further. I mean, I, again, not having a lot of um, knowledge of the stuff written in the comic books, but just knowing so much in that last scene, like where, and again, this is credit to those super fans that point this stuff out, like you're saying, and you, you know, you go back and watch it, but, um, and somebody pointed this out and something I was reading that early on when Loki's taking, uh, he's sitting at the computer and he's kind of taking some tasks or getting acclimated to the TVA, you know, he's halfway paying attention or reading a book or magazine or whatever. Apparently on a screenshot of that, you can see there's like a scenario that uh, they're putting up that talks about Thanos. And, um, and then like if Thanos had this many apples, blah, 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 it's like a math problem, hmm. but with Thanos name in there and everything else. And then later on you hear, um, you know, the, the uh, guy at the end, uh, and I guess it would be Kang at this point is what we're, what we're saying, you know, is very intentionally he's eating an apple and he talks about Thanos being just insignificant in the timeline. And so like to think of somebody so villainous as Thanos, so great, that's the huge, everybody was talking about just how, you know, how he was played and portrayed and he was so evil, just ultimate villain. And then now to think that here comes something that is just going to make him look like nothing just a not i mean it's just very very intriguing to me and just the fact that you know he's eating an apple and basically tossing aside to kind of reference that thanos is is nothing compared to him so excited for that to come okay and sarah yeah like it's all gonna be good um like shang chi is coming we have the eternals coming but i just i had so much fun with thor ragnarok i am so pumped for the next four. I was like, can we do that again? That would be great. <laughs> and it, it all all of them are shaping up to like all of the I guess returning stories are shaping up to be like 
in my mind what Captain America Civil War was like kind of the big almost team up movies where there's going to be a lot of different stories now obviously the introductory stories um probably won't have as much as that because we have to be introduced to the characters whether they're theatrical or on Disney plus um but so then my my background is uh, Avengers Campus, which everybody knows has opened in Disney's California Adventure now. Um, and everybody has probably listened to several podcasts on it. Um, I know Lou Mangello did one recently about um, kind of looking around and visiting and things to look for in Avengers Campus. So I thought it'd be fun to ask because Avengers Campus exists so you can interact with these characters. And it also exists almost like separate from it, it is separate from the movies and the shows so that you can have Black Widow still present in Avengers Campus, even though in the story, the main story, she's not there anymore. You can have Steve Rogers and Sam Wilson both um, dressing up as Captain America or in their Captain America costumes. And so I thought it would be fun to see of the stories you you have heard so far or watched. Um, if you could add something to Avengers Campus, what would it be? What would be your thing to add from these stories to Avengers Campus so that you could have that interaction with people? Go ahead, Jamie. I'd love to be able to like walk onto the sets of WandaVision <clears throat> to like just be able to like get my picture taken in the kitchen with the with it all being like black and white so now I don't even want the cut like you know in the different like scenes to be able to walk through and like get your picture taken in like each different decade or something I think that'd be really neat okay Lisa so give me a great movie ride that's just Marvel like just like the old great movie ride where you've got like somebody driving you through and I haven't decided who that person should be like Yandu for some reason was the first person that comes to mind <laughs> but, like something <laughs> Like that will take you through like each phase of the universe and like you're kind of interacting with and seeing all the different movies like great movie ride style what about and, the guy from ant-man he can be he you know that he can yeah. recap everything all the movies for us as we go through there you go. yeah <laughs> the um uh, not to not to throw out something that <clears throat> is too controversial to to parks fans um i did hear someone saying hey if you could do a seasonal overlay of um the carousel of progress with wandavision how interesting would that be not something permanent because like for me i i really i still like <laughs> yeah, i it was broken the last time we were there and i was very very sad um i don't ever want it to go away but it did make me think like maybe an overlay of that or just build something separate for that attraction because it was really really fun to to see that I, I agree it would be cool to kind of walk through those sets um ryan what would you add to avengers campus okay go with me here a little bit so i would love to see like suri's lab i'll go back to you know one of my characters i relate to but so think of it as like a flight up passage had a baby with the old retro uh, image works of imagination pavilion so <laughs> basically i would love to see like suri leading us through some new tech she's developing then we go on some kind of experience where we experience that whether it's like a flight of passage kind of thing or something kind of exciting and thrilling and then it's spill out into her workstation area at the end where um, we can kind of tinker with latest tech I'm, a, I'm an Epcot guy at heart, like an Epcot Center guy at heart. So um, kind of a kind of a new spin on some of that old type stuff that they built Epcot on and kind of like a, that would be the um, innovations kind of piece slash image works where you can tinker and play with being creative and perseverance. So that's, that's okay. my thought, that's my okay. dream, dream attraction there. And then Sarah, what would you add? Oh no, I've been trying to really not see it the Avengers campus until I get there. So I'm like, I don't know what's already there right now. Um, but I don't know, I, I would like to go to Wakanda. That would be great. That'd be pretty cool. We're all in agreement. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, the, I there are so many different possibilities. And now with like, you know, there are gonna be multiple campuses around the world in different parks. Um, my My dream would be 
for the contract to be worked out, the agreement to be worked out where we could have Marvel and MCU characters in the Florida parks, because those are the ones that that I get to when I get to parks. Um, that would be my dream is just to have access to to all of that. Um, so thank you, everybody, for agreeing to do this. This was a lot of fun. Um, and it's something I've been looking forward to for a long time. I think everybody here knows we originally kind of broached this topic maybe end of May or early June, something like that. And so it's just been something that I've been thinking about um, and wanting to do. And we have great conversations about Marvel and the MCU in class. Um, and so I kind of wanted to sort of replicate that and, and thank you for participating. Before we take off, um, we'll just go around and if you can remind everybody um, how they can get in contact with you either through social or if you have your podcast or anything that you want to do, um, how can people best get hold of you? So I'll go ahead and start with Sarah. Yeah, I have a website, sarahbealssager.com. I just got married. So sometimes it's Sarah Beals, sometimes it's Sarah Sager. But I think if you type either one, it should get to my website at this point. Um, I'm pretty uh, responsive on LinkedIn and uh, slightlyproblematic.net is our website. Okay. All right, Jamie. Um, so I'm I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, just if you put Jamie Williams spelled J A I M E at T N Tech Edu, you can email me. I'm happy to respond to any emails. Okay, Lisa. I don't have a website or anything. <laughs> oh, Lisa. Go uh, ahead, my Lisa. Site, my site is thecastlerun.com, and I cover um, sort of life, life in Central Florida, um, Disney, and running primarily, um, but just life in general. Um, you'll find the shop there, Core Memory Candles, or you can just go to corememorycandles.com for the fragrance shop. Um, I'm on Instagram and very active as the Castle Runner, um, and the Core Memory Candles also has its own handle there. Um, I'm very responsive across all platforms. And you can find me on Facebook just under Lisa Genoto Glasner or the Castle Run. And Lisa, real quick, I have to, I have to say, I, I could never place the smell of the water in Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and then when I got the candle, I was like, there it is. That's it. That's, that's what that is there. I had that very, burning very last fun. night from Lisa, by the way, I was burning in my living room. While I was relaxing last night. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> that's, that's, um, yeah, Pirates was my hardest. Pirates yeah. was far and yeah. my most well sent. So well, thank you. It's just one of, when people say like, you know, the smell when you get there, I could never place it. And then I'm like, yeah, there it is. So you did it's, fantastic. It's really complex. Um, the coolest thing is that now I'll, people will always reach out, but people will not infrequently reach out to me and say that they were on Pirates and they said it smells like my candle <laughs> on Pirates <laughs> rather than the other way around. Very nice. The coolest thing. So. Yeah, that's very cool. I've got Haunted Mansion. Haunted Mansion's on right now in my uh, wax melt. Oh, love very it. cool. Love it. <laughs> Ryan, go ahead. How can people get uh, in touch with you? Yeah, so... Um, we have our website, mydisneyclass.com, all one word. And uh, you know, we have our podcast linked on there and everything like that. So if you're interested in that, if you're into education, that would be, and Disney, that'd be a, a great place to go, I think. Uh, hopefully it would be. Um, and I'm on all the social medias. I think Twitter, uh, I'm Diz Ed Design at Diz Ed Design. And then the rest of them, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, missing one or whatever. But uh, it's just, it's Ryan Beckman or R Beckman and it's D O E C K M N. That's it. All right. Well, great. Again, thank you all for doing this. Um, this was so much fun and we'll, we'll have to do stuff like this again. Thanks. Have a great rest of your day. Have a good one. Thanks. Thanks, Cody.